Hi, Andrew. Hello, Jackie. I really enjoyed your talk. And Thank I'm going you. to start with the, the piece that really fascinated me, which was right. the, um, the conversation about how the French are using high-speed rail to change the balance of their economy. Can you talk a bit more about that? Well, certainly, yes. I mean, the, the French and their relationship with high-speed rail has been a long one. So mm. There aren't specific uh, uh, one-solution-fits-all uh, right. responses to that point. But the, the fact is that the French have used that technology, the high-speed rail technology, since about 1982 when they opened the line from Paris to Lyon right. uh, to, to act as a motor for the economy in France. Mm -hmm. So Paris-Lyon was a way of getting greater con yeah. connectivity between those two cities, of course. Um, and then progressively building the line down to Marseille, building the connection up TGV Nord to the Channel Tunnel. And all of these lines have in effect used the technology and the connectivity that high-speed rail can bring in order to get a, a, a cert achieve certain specific objectives. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking a little bit earlier about uh, the line from Paris to Tours, yeah. which has been built uh, for some time, but now it's being extended, South Europe Atlantic it's called, mm -hmm. to make the new line down to Bordeaux. And what it's doing is, is relieving the existing railway line, which um, is congested. Uh, it's also improving the journey time to Bordeaux, but it's also enfranchising people in Bordeaux and beyond Bordeaux um, to actually connect with Paris and elsewhere. And, and that's got specific objectives. It's got um, a plan and the line is responding to the economic challenge. So in each case, there's a strategy behind that. It's not the same strategy for every new piece of infrastructure. Right, okay. Um, so you just, they're trying to switch or change the balance so it's not so agricultural using well, the line I was saying that, yes, to I, allow it, people to travel. Th what was yeah. interesting, if you look at the analysis of the Loire Valley area and mm. the, the, what is effectively a regional economy, and a lot of, of British people, of course, uh, know the Loire Valley. It's mm. very popular for tourists. And, and yet the, um, the economy of uh, some of the regions of France has been very heavily uh, yeah. built around agriculture. That's not such an attractive proposition for young people. Young people are uh, looking for opportunities in the service sector and uh, elsewhere and high-speed lines in France have given uh, an opportunity for people to travel um, and the line from Paris to Tours, if you analyse the, the data on that, it's clear that the um, unemployment has, um, uh, statistics have improved in that area and there's been some response, albeit uh, not necessarily uh, stellar, but it's been a response to, to that objective and you can measure that in the numbers. And, and the French do have a system of retrospectively analysing every project they do and then saying, OK, has this re reached our target, has this met our objectives yeah. and has the infrastructure investment had the impact okay. on the... Uh, the socio-economic environment that we anticipated. So it's not, it's, they don't see it as a chance thing, they try to manage the impact. Yes, it's, 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 it's carefully um, anticipated, carefully mm -hmm. forecast, carefully managed and reviewed afterwards, which is quite interesting because each major investment in transport since 1982 has had this report which has actually given the return on experience. Okay. Um, and this is part of a, a you know, strategic shift but it's a different shift in different places. So the, 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 the example of, of Paris to Tours um, mm -hmm. and the line which um, is being built down to Bordeaux and the services to Angoulême and Poitiers mm -hmm. and so on are all part of a strategy, but the strategy is slightly different in right. different places. Oh, it's you know, fascinating. It's, it's not as if high-speed rail is, is, is an answer to everything yeah. and neither is it an answer to one thing. And can, I think, you know, can you see them using it as a way of uh, using the projects, building the railways, as a way of attracting new entrants into the industry? Is it, does well, that uh, work? Yes, uh, undoubtedly. I mean, the, yeah. you know, the, 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 the fact of making this investment in France, the fact of, um, of, of, of building the lines, the fact of building the rolling stock to run on the lines, is all really part of a, of a, a very interesting um, relationship between the French state and yeah. and the private sector. Uh -huh. um, you know, the the private sector is of course involved with construction. It's involved with rolling stock. Um, it's involved with um, uh, every aspect of these projects, and that's actually been increasingly the case. So there's a the, the South Europe Atlantic line is actually a PPP. It's a mm. PPP project. Um, oh. So it's actually right. interesting that they've taken the, the British concept, mm. a homegrown PPP, and, they've, um, and they've, we, that's been an export product of right. the UK, the, yeah. the financial concept. 
Um, but Tour Bordeaux uh, is being built as a PPP and uh, all of that is part of, um, of, of this relationship between the French state and the French private sector uh, advocating French um, engineering mm. and research, contributing to a bigger picture, if you like, right. um, which is really important for, okay. for, the, for them. Now, back to the UK, um, we've built one high-speed railway line and we want to build another one. Are there lessons from HS1 that you can take on to HS2 in terms of how to get public support or how to demonstrate it didn't create the chaos that everyone's predicting? As, um, and also just simply how to get it built more efficiently or as efficiently as possible. Well, uh, High Speed One uh, or Channel Tunnel Rail Link was a really interesting story. I mean, it was the, uh, the objective primarily there was to link the Channel Tunnel with London and to yeah. link, in fact to link Paris with London. And it's really satisfied that objective, I think, yeah. you know, objectively. Um, what um, was interesting is that because of the timing of it and because of the mechanism for uh, obtaining the powers for High Speed yeah. One, is it, it really had to reset the, uh, the bar in terms of um, the environmental impact. Um, yeah. It really had to establish a new standard mm. for construction, quality, and uh, the contribution of engineering to the right. project. Because it was, a, it was a new line, and it had a new specification, and it had a new approach. Mm. So it really gave everyone who was involved with the project, I was proud to be associated with it, um, an opportunity to work in a different way right. and if you look at the lessons learned from that mm. of course it's the environmental impact which uh, is, is really very, be very interesting and transferred uh, a new standard across and HS2 are building on that standard mm. but um, there was also uh, an attitude to the supply chain a relationship which was collaborative there were target crossed NEC form contracts for example used right. on that which was yeah, yeah. was relatively new mm. initiative at the time Crossrail is using those now but um, nonetheless bringing the NEC form of contract into mm. all of those um, relationships was really important and establishing a new method whereby the, the, the railway engineering had its own safety case. Yes. Most of Network Rail's um, uh, engineering activities comply with Network Rail standards, but on CTRL we had a new safety case and mm. a new approach to safety so that we had innovative products on, on, a, oh, on CTRL. Oh, right, so you, did, how, that you were working what, with the supply chain to develop the product? Well, we had a, a different approach to the way in which the project was signed off from a safety perspective. Right. The entire project had its own safety case so mm. that products could be introduced which were not network rail products uh -huh. and which were, if you like, uh, the, the, the output of dialogue with the supply chain, mm -hmm. um, different sleeper types, uh, a different uh, specification for all manner of products, right. including cab-based signalling, for example, okay. right. uh, mechanisms which were automatic to ensure that engineering staff working at night mm -hmm. could have automatic access um, subject to certain processes um, to the railway at night to do maintenance. That process hasn't uh, uh, no. been m maintained in the network rail infrastructure, no. but there's all sorts of innovation yes. in terms of product and process, which um, CTRL developed mm -hmm. and, and that set a new standard. So those lessons will get passed on to HS2? Let's hope, hope so. Yes, let's hope so. Last, last um, area, light rail, um, well away from high speed too. And I know that you know quite a lot about that. Is, is there still a role for light rail in the UK? It's not had the best of press lately. So. Well, I think light rail um, has a role throughout the world mm. as fitting a market, right. which is a market for people who want to travel locally with a reliable and safe service. And uh, that's proven its worth mm. in many cities' conurbations around the world. Uh -huh. um, it's, uh, it fulfills a role within a niche. Mm. Um, it would be difficult to say that the UK can't benefit from that experience, mm. which is in a sense analogous to high-speed rail in the way that you know, high-speed rail is a technology, it's a way of travelling fast, light rail is a technology, it's a way of travelling less fast. Yes. But nonetheless, these all have a niche to play and mm. our job, I think, in the UK is to ensure that we get the right solution mm. to the right um, uh, challenge. Uh, right. yes. you know. So, I mean, light rail has a role to play. Uh, there are lots of light rail schemes which are um, on the drawing board mm. or in the development stage in the UK. What we've got to do is make sure that they all fly from a business case perspective, mm. make sure they're all properly engineered and that the operating plans are, are well thought through right. and that it, it, it 
satisfies the objectives. Right. Because if you shoehorn something into an environment where it doesn't satisfy yeah. the objectives, quite obviously you're going to fail from the outset. Where it goes wrong. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, All right, yeah. Andrew, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks very much.